complex calculations for values in your particle systems. This is going to be what makes your particle systems go from just, hey, we have a particle when we shoot it into a direction, into something that is potentially more malleable and more interesting to look at. And just generally, there's going to be a lot of math involved. Don't worry about it. I know a lot of math might sound like a headache, and it very much could be, but we're going to go through this one step at a time. So you've seen me in some of these other particle systems saying, hey, I want to get, uh, for instance, I believe here, the ribbon width. We're getting this as a float value from a curve, which takes a value from this curve here based on uh, the curve index value. And that is the simplest version of what a complex value could be. Well, the very simplest version probably would be just multiplying two values together, to be fair with you. Today we're just going to go through and make something that nests a couple of these little things down in each other, so that you can get a little bit more of an understanding of what this module uh, can do and how these modules can like, be more complex very, very quickly, which both is a confusing thing sometimes, uh, but also can be really, really nice. So let's make a new emitter for this. Just start fresh. We'll make this uh, an empty emitter and we will create this and call this like complex emitter or something like that. And here on emitter update, we'll add in a spawn rate. Uh, let's say that we're spawning in 25 uh, particles per second. Then on particle spawn, we'll add a velocity. Uh, we'll fix issue and add solve forces and velocity. We've done all this before, so I'm going to kind of speed through this. Now, what I want to take a look at is our uh, velocity here, because this is just a vector three value, right? It's an X, a Y, and a Z value. And we can set this, but it's kind of annoying to set these individually. We can like bother with curves and stuff like that. What if we want to just split this up into three float values? Because that is effectively what a vector three is. It's just three float values and, and like coding, it has some functionality uh, together with it, but effectively, it's just three values coming together to make like one value that's easier to whoop. Well, you can actually simply do that. You can make a vector from float, and then we get at one single value, right, that we can work with. So now it just spits them out into one single direction. Doesn't really do what I wanted to do though. So we've got a different one, uh, and that is make vector. Not make vector from float, just make vector. And that one supplies you with a separate X, Y, and Z. And as you can see now, the wonderful thing is we created that by using this little drop down menu. And there you get all the different like calculation stuff that you can do. But now each one of these axes individually, the X, the Y, and the Z, also have their own little drop down menu. So you can nest this stuff deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper until you've reached what you wanted. I do want to uh, pay a little bit of attention to a slightly, maybe more complex way to do it uh, in some ways, but once you've learned it, it might be a little bit less complex to do it. We are not going to be using uh, this way that I'm going to be showing you right now, but I do want you to be aware of it. And that is, you can make your own scripts. So in this case, we have a input, then we just get the X, the Y, and the Z value, and we output, right? as just a script that the engine provides you with. You can make your own scripts. We talked a little bit about them before. Uh, in the FX, you can make a script, and there you can make a Niagara module script, or a function script, or a dynamic input script. Again, I feel like for the most part, this is unnecessarily complex because you now need to start learning like all these new nodes. And while that can make some of the things that we're about to do a little bit more smooth and a little bit easier, and more reusable because once you've made one of these scripts you can very easily reuse it in different places inside one emitter inside multiple emitters inside a system so i might do some videos on this in the future but it's probably going to be as part of like a niagara intermediate course instead because this is an entire like subsection in and of itself what we're going to do instead is we're just going to nest the ever living help out of these individual values. It can be a little bit bothersome and a little bit cumbersome to read once these become like very complex. So at that point, again, it is worth trying to like learn how to make these scripts instead. Uh, for now, we're just gonna do it the simple straightforward way. So let's get started. Uh, we want the X value to be a range of 
a minimum value to a maximum value. So let's get started with that. We can get a, a float in range, random float in range. And here we can say we want that range to be minus one to positive one. And that doesn't really do anything until we set the velocity speed scale for the velocity itself uh, to be higher. And now we can see in the x direction, if we set this to like 10, maybe 100, every single particle is getting, in specifically the x direction, a random value applied to it. So some of them are going to be shooting out faster, some of them are going to be shooting out slower, some of them are going to be shooting out like not at all, effectively. And we can kind of like copy that over, so we can just copy over what we just did for the x, and we can put that in uh, the y as well. So we can paste that, and now every single particle is spreading out in a two-dimensional plane in its own different direction. And then if we set the z uh, to always being like one, we get something kind of like this kind of like a cone shape that we're creating, right? And you can already see that we're making like these separate values that we can do stuff with, and it's very, very fun. Uh, obviously, I would probably prefer to also have this be a um, random float in a range. So let's paste this in here, but instead uh, between like zero and one. And that creates uh, a slightly more interesting shape. And now we can very easily say, okay, but we want to maybe uh, actually set this to 0 0.5 to one. So it's always a little bit more upward and none of them spread out very two-dimensionally. They always have some upward uh, movements. And then on the particle updates, of course, we can start adding uh, some gravity to this. And that creates something where we need a lot more velocity uh, on initial spawn. So let's set this to like 750. <laughs> uh, that's maybe a little much maybe back to like 500. And we are starting to make our own little fountain here. Now, clearly this can use a little bit more work, right? So let's actually see if we can make something that uh, hooks into something like a parameter. So let's go into my uh, particle or emitter spawn rather, and we can make a parameter and we will make a new uh, flow parameter and we will call this uh, by renaming it spread. This is just going to be how far these things spread out. So the default value is going to be, let's set it to 0.5 instead. And back in add velocity, uh, we can now use that spread value. So instead of using just the minimum of minus one and the maximum of one, we're going to be using a maximum of spread. We're going to be doing that for the y as well. So again, look up spread. And then these minimums uh, are going to need to be calculations of their own. So what we do is we simply get another one of these multiply float nodes. And this is going to just multiply our parameter spread, which we have right here, by a value of negative one. And again, we can just say, hey, we want to copy this uh, calculation that we have right here for the minimum. And we're just going to paste that right here into the minimum of the other one. And now we have a single value that we can just change here. I can say the spread here will be two, and now they spread out much further. If I set the spread to negative one, uh, they almost don't spread out at all. And that's because it's now just using a parameter or a variable in these calculations to decide all the like random directions that we have. And it's just a much easier way to control what your particles do rather than having to go into each module and Again, once it is set up once, you can see there's like a lot of nesting going on here, which makes it kind of difficult to read, which again, there you go into the maybe making the script is more easy to read once you get into some more complex calculations. So do keep that in mind. But maybe just as like a weird ID, uh, in the emitter update, we can also uh, set the parameter to a new value. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to get our spread value so we can just uh, add our spread value and here we get into some interesting stuff right because we have our spread but we also have the initial value of spread and this is quite interesting because this is going to never change this is always going to be the initial value that we give it uh, in this setting of particle spawn that's what initial means but we can still update the spread value of the emitter in like either in particle spawn on a per particle basis or in emitter updates as i'm doing right here so what we're going to be doing is we want to set spread to a multiply float 
of the initial value of spread. So we get spread and then the initial value uh, multiplied by the emitter's age. So now as the emitter lives longer, the spread is going to be spreading out further and further and further. And uh, it will loop after about 10 seconds in this case, which will uh, reset it back to the start. But you can see how this makes something a lot more dynamic. So now this spread does influence how far these things spread, but that is then in turn influenced by how long this emitter is around. So if I put this just in a uh, in a world instead, so let's uh, put this in a system and we're going to put this into the world, you'll be able to see that the longer that this lives, and I do need to actually uh, set this to apply and save it, otherwise it's not going to do anything, uh, but the longer that this lives, the further these are going to be spreading out endlessly and endlessly. So uh, this is a example of something that maybe you don't want to like infinitely have around because these particles are going to get like very, very speedy, very, very quickly uh, in a moment here. But you can have a lot of fun with some very interesting values uh, that you can play with in these particles. Again, at this point, uh, the particles are literally already kind of flying out of there. Uh, so maybe in order to make that a little bit more like consistent, what we actually want to do is the velocity. Uh, we want to have this random range float, which again, we're going to copy uh, because we're going to be uh, pasting it back in uh, because I want to multiply this uh, float by the age of the emitter as well. And then we're going to be pasting in the thing that we just copy over again. It's a little bit annoying that you have to do this. I wish that it wouldn't do it this way, but uh, it's just kind of how it works. And now it's also going to be spewing these particles out higher, higher and higher, uh, depending on how old the emitter is, which again is going to increase in value uh, fairly quickly. <laughs> and as you can see, it's already like shooting them like into the stars and beyond. So uh, there's some fun stuff to work with there. I'm going to disable this because I feel like at some point that's going to crash my engine and I don't want it to do that. If you want to check out something uh, that does like even more of this like nesting and nesting and nesting, I have a tutorial that walks you through creating like a spiral like galaxy-like uh, particle effect, uh, which doesn't use velocity or forces at all. What it does instead is uh, in particle update, it rotates around point, so it sets the location directly, and it does like a bunch of math like this to decide for each individual particle where it should rotate it towards. So it rotates it around a center point and then also moves it away from that center point based on like a couple of different calculations, a couple of different like randomly generated values. It's a very, very good example of something that you can do with this like more complex uh, value math. So I think I'm going to probably insert that video into the playlist for this series as well. If you're watching this as it's coming out, uh, do go just check it out on my channel. If you're watching this in the playlist, it should be the next video up. I don't think I will include it in the full series uh, supercut, but maybe I will. I don't know. We'll see. If the next video, if you're watching the full series of supercuts and the next video is not about a spiraling galaxy-like particle effect, but instead about, I don't know what the next video is about, anything else, uh, just do go on the channel and look something like galaxy and it should be fairly easy to find. I think it is a good exercise to really get into making these more complex values and starting to get a feel for how all that works. Specifically because we're directly setting the positions of all of this instead of relying on all the velocity and forces, which for the most part, when you're making particle effects, you are going to be using velocity and forces. You're not going to be directly like doing a bunch of math to set something. But as an exercise, I think it works out fairly well. And I think next time, what we should probably look into is the very reason that I started doing a material series before this, and that is uh, particle materials. We have talked a lot about particle uh, simulation now, but let's look into making the particles also like look a little bit better. And we're going to be doing that by making our own particle material that is a little bit more involved than just, hey, this is a circle and the circle has a color. So I'll see you all back when we go for that. 
and for the full course if you're watching this in the future it should be all up on the youtube channel already but if you're watching this shortly after it was uploaded there will be a link down below in the description to the patreon where you can find the full course and a very big thank you to all of my patreons you can see them on screen right now if you want to help out supporting the channel there's a link down below in the description to the patreon page a huge thank you to my cave student tier supporters earl monteville erno and my cave digger tier supporters sergey thomas